Good afternoon. How about a prayer? Yeah, and we have handouts. Um, but we left some back in the back chair and some up here. Is there anybody before we begin who did not get one? Okay, wait, I'm going to lower it. Spirit to keep us awake in this siesta time after lunch and help us to continue to learn from one another. Thank you for being here with us. Saint Sebastian, patron of athletes, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. So ask just quickly, and please be honest, I talk with my hands. Can you all hear me if I don't use a microphone, or would you prefer I use one? Are you good at the back? Thumbs? Yes? Okay, awesome. So my name is Lauren Mark. I'm the principal at Seton LaSalle High School. Uh, to give you a little bit of background to put this into context, uh, we have a school of about 430 students, boys and girls, roughly 50-50 in a given year, give or take 5% of points. Uh, but we have a diverse population. We have international students. We have the whole socioeconomic spectrum in our schools. Uh, so I'm sure very similar to a lot of the schools that you're in. Close to a city, you have some suburban students. So to kind of put this into context, we have also a very strong tradition of athletic programs within our school. And that's everything from a fencing team to a basketball team to a rugby team. Take your pick. The point being that what we're going to talk about is applicable to pretty much everyone that's in here. So to give you a little bit of background on myself, I was a high school athlete, I was a college athlete. I'm in my fifth year at Seton LaSalle. Uh, my eighth year as a Catholic school administrator, um, and, but then I spent time in both Catholic and public schools teaching English. So when we talk about director of sports ministries and what this means, part of it is the connection that you have with the person who you intend to be your director of sports ministries. And for us, that is Kathy Ray. So I will turn it over to her for an introduction. I'd like to take issue with Lou's first point that you should hire somebody who's an athlete. Um, I just push myself to and from the table. <laughs> and I drive to get my kids where they need to go or did for their sports. I am no athlete. Um, so I just want to say that from the get-go. I get sports. I love sports. Um, not necessarily professional sports, and I am a Pittsburgher, just saying. There are a few of us out there. Um, but I, I've watched what it has done for my children, and it has been wonderful. I'm also a parent. I was a parent at Seton Lewis House, so I have that vested interest in the school as well. But I am a minister. And that's what really matters. So I will be coming to you a little bit differently than what you've been hearing already. And I wasn't here last night. We um, needed to be at school yesterday uh, for Mass. So, uh, so that really is my priority. So I'll kind of be speaking to you from that bent, from being a, a minister who sees the value of bringing ministry into sports. So uh, our population, Lauren's giving you an idea of our population. Uh, we're also very diverse religiously. Uh, many, most of our students are Roman Catholic, but we follow, I'm sure, as your schools do, the national standard that says in any <coughs> parish, 30 to 28 to 27 percent of your registered parishioners come to Sunday Mass. So, <clears throat> a number of our kids may be Catholic, that doesn't mean that they are practicing their faith at home, and so we are aware of that. We also, because we have a number of international students, have very many, you know, per capita, unchurched at all, you know, with, with not even no experience of faith with a negative connotation about what faith is about, you know, faith equals folly. So we have kind of that to work with as well. And, um, and it's, so it's made ministry a real challenge, 
but wonderful. It's so it was so very nice of the Holy Spirit to bring the mission of the church to us, so that I wasn't traveling across the ocean. Um, you know that they have come to us, so it, it provides a real ripe opportunity for us to use sport uh, to be able to evangelize. So, just a real quick question. Yes, I'm also from Pittsburgh, a long time ago. Where are you located? In Pittsburgh? We're in uh, Mount Lebanon, but closer to the city. We're only five miles outside of downtown, essentially. So, but in a suburban area. Okay, so to give you an idea of how quickly this kind of came about for us, um, in about June of last, not this past summer, but the previous, or no, it was this past summer, that's how quickly it was, um, the director of our board came to me and said, I learned about this new great program called Sports Leader uh, when I was over at Franciscan University of Steubenville. And I saw some Franciscan people here, still here? There you go, good. And he said, I, I think you should check it out. So I looked into it, and I got a call from Lou Judd. And Lou Judd said, I'd love to come talk with you about my, about my program. So I said, well, come on over. So in about July, met with Lou Judd, and after about a two-hour conversation, I was sold. But it doesn't matter if I'm sold. I said, okay, well, let's see if this program is something that works for our school. So I took it to Kathy, who is actually, in addition to Director of Sports Ministries, she is one of our co-campus ministers, but she's in charge of all of the liturgy for the school. Um, and in that respect, I wanted to talk to her about this program as a ministry. So I approached Kathy. She took a look at the program. She said, yeah, I like this. So I took it to our athletic director, who's also our football coach. He looked at the program and said, yeah. I get it, I like this. Took it to a couple coaches. So they said, yeah, this, this seems like a really good program. So one of the things that we found out is the key to success with this is having the familiarity of the community before you just launch the program. It was let a couple people take a look at it. See if this is something that fits for your community. Naturally in a Catholic school, it fits pretty well. The second piece was having a joint probability of the success. So after all these people took a look, they said, can we do this? So this is July. We want to start this in August. Can, can we do this? It was, well, why not? Let's give it a try. <clears throat> and then a unilateral approach, everybody being on the same page. So we had the buy-in from the entire administrative staff plus our athletic department and the campus ministry department. That was all this. That, so that, that's your whole buy-in. So you got everybody that's in this picture on board with the concept. So they, they haven't talked to Lou Judd yet. They haven't met him. They haven't looked at the full program. But generally speaking, ministry <coughs> of sports. You know, we have probably 60 at least percent of our student body is some kind of athlete within the school. So, after we got the buy-in from the community, it was fairly easy to start the implementation process. But before we go into that, to give you a kind of example of how well this has worked, I'd like to show you a brief video. That was brief. <laughs> Thank you. 
when they become Catholic virtues. Naturally, coming into a Catholic school, the students have an understanding of what that means, but the coaches can really go into detail on how that applies to sports. And as much as we all would love to think we have a great impact on students all the time, is who are they with the most besides their parents, their coaches? As that director at a Catholic school, uh, obviously faith is always going to be a huge part of what we do here. Uh, but the sports leader program, Basically, we wrap it up into one package for us with um, the materials, the structure, and the ceremonies that we, we would not have had here for one without. Quickly, you're filled in a gap where what we do in the building is something that kids have to be a part of. They're obligated to come to school. But they choose to be with their coaches. They choose to spend hours after school training and working and pushing their limits. And there is the visual place that virtue and faith can go. We know our coaches are men and women of faith. They show that again and again. But this gives them a real format to make that much more important. I was the biggest skeptic when we were proposing this summer. I said to myself, there's never going to be time to handle all these components. Where are we going to squeeze this in? We do have a very tight schedule. Um, but the juice is worth the squeeze. The, you know, the, the dad choked up at the dad ceremony, the girls choked out you know, when they read their letters to their mom. I learned more about those girls in the five or ten minutes of seven seven weeks than I would have been a normal season. Hail Mary, Holy Spirit, the Lord is with you. Sports has been a really great part of our athletic program. I've seen it grow our team. Like one of the virtues was like perseverance itself. Especially across the country, perseverance is a big thing because you're kind of out there on your own and just you in your own head. So you have to be able to persevere. But it also sort of reminded me that I can lean on not only the other people on the team, but mostly on Christ. We didn't really have a good season, so we feel like losing a lot. And that at first, we didn't take it really well. Everyone was just mad at each other, just disappointed and sad. Then as we worked more in communication and like working together, we became formed as a team, and we overall became better. The ceremony is our people's favorite part. It's something that the mothers get to experience with their children, the fathers get to experience with their children, and that for everyone seems to be sort of those culminating moments where they go, yes, this is why we really like this program, because they see what's going on. Boys don't tend to share their feelings as well as maybe we would like them to. So with Devin, to hear some of the things that he had to say during his letter reading was very emotional for both of us. I mean, I know he loves me, I love him, but um, to hear those things and him to be comfortable enough to say them in front of his peers, uh, that was very moving. For basketball, the fourth of the ceremonies were really a great experience, honestly. When the dad came up to talk about it, he went up to Jeremy, it was great to just see like, all of the players come together and their families and their dads. It was all kind of just like we were watching the image of many people paired up, and it was a really great way to just say what we really thought and how we really felt in ways that we normally can. My mom never cried, but I saw it was scary and I was like, we pumped that out. In 26 years, uh, being around football on high school and college level, it was probably the most wonderful hour ceremony I've ever seen. With a bunch of football players and their mom. We had about 25 kids, and from 1 to 25, it was just wonderful. And we literally had five or six kids break down in tears to see our teammates encouraging their teammates and cheering each other on. And, you know, while they were reading letters to their mom in front of everybody, I mean, it was, it was the most wonderful thing I've seen in 20 years of football. We actually had my parents this year for the first time tell their son that they loved. And that was, that was very, very touching. The first dad we had go, I mean, he's a big, bushy, blue-collar worker, big beard. The last guy in the world you think would shed a tear. He just up there crying like a baby, so proud of his daughter. And seeing that, and then the girls react to that, it's, it's special, it really is. I am here as sports minister. I'm here to support and encourage coaches. I try to stay out of their way, and yet I try to also be there for them when they need them. Um, I'm all about empowering and stepping back. Coaches are very good at the formational part physically and about teamwork, very, very essential elements. But having
having someone who understands a bit the nature of that teenager's soul uh, is also very, very valuable for making the work very effective. The program has run very smoothly, and I do think that's because there is somebody, Kathy, as the enforcement <coughs> who is actually facilitating the program, doing the training with the coaches, meeting with student athletes, talking to parents, and the feedback from the parents has been phenomenal. Kids don't typically give you a lot of feedback, but you know they say, oh, God, I like it, or it works really well, or I kind of understand my coach a little bit better. Whereas the parents say, this is why I pay $10,000 a year to send my kid to see them now, because you do things like this. I really think you need a uh, sports minister or someone who's taking that component on from the school side. Someone who also knows the students during the school day that can then help work with you out of the school hours and work together towards that so that they can also keep in the loop of different students going through different situations who also live here see themselves out of our family. And I try to preach that and that practice in a team where we're a family within the team, but we're a family within the school as well. And I think when you have a sports minister or director like that who is working in the school and knows these students as well, it really shows and you know, you've got a, a really good end result. I know it's not in the big team events, maybe 1% of the kids are going to the NFL. So why are we here? We want to win games and we want to beat your opponent. We're also here holding young men and young women and hoping that each and every one of them go on to be a successful adult. This program has also helped us uh, understand that, yes, you do want to win. You really do. You want to win every game. But, you know, we're trying to create something bigger than that here at Team NFL. As a Christian player, you think about how your actions reflect who you are and how you play the field. You still need to show the values that you've learned. There's a distinct difference between winning and playing the game well. You can win, but if you do it in a way that doesn't represent our school or our faith in a great manner, you've lost. When you approach a coaching and a captain, you really have to think about the religious component, the sports component as well, and how to mesh the two together. If, if these players are only learning about volleyball for me, then I'm failing. So I really believe they have to be learning more than just the sport they need to be learning about life, how to be a good person. Hopefully it makes that a lot easier for me to do. introduction. Now we're done. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> uh, we'll get into a little bit more detail on what the director of sports ministry says. Uh, but that gives you an idea of just how it may seem impossible at first, what the task is at hand, and it seem overwhelming. But at the same time, if you have the right people, if you have the right people in place, in less than a year, you can actually get a great program up and running. So we have 21 varsity sports. Um, 18 of them are state sanctioned. The other ones are more club teams like fencing um, and bowling and, that, and hockey, that sort of thing. But at the moment, we, with just introducing it this summer, uh, we only have three teams that have chosen not to do sports leader. Uh, and so we'll talk a little bit more about that approach but the director of sports ministry is being a key component into making that work. So, just in general, why sports leader in the first place? Well, we needed a well-designed program. Uh, we are currently using, um, our, our coaches are all trained in the Play Like a Champion program, which philosophically is wonderful. Sports leader provided that application piece that said, as a coach, how do I do this? I love what this means. How do I take this to my players and to my team? So we needed a well-designed program, and this meant both the strengths and the needs of our athletic department. And so one of our goals as an athletic department was to unify the teams. Um, as many of you, I'm sure, experience, you have a lot of school, or you have a lot of programs that are successful, but they tend to be inclusive within themselves. So we wanted to find some way to unify our teams so that we had a commonality among our athletic department. 
We really liked the idea of the director of sports ministries because it was a person who could pull all of that together and be a great support to our coaches. And as we found out, we already had that person on staff. So most of you, I would say, you could probably think of who works within your organization or who works within your school and say, there's probably somebody here that already has the buy-in to our mission, that has the buy-in to the mission of overall, and really can take this on, athletic background or not. So what we have found is the sports minister is a great liaison between the administration and the coaches. So how many principals or assistant principals do, you, do I have in the room? A couple? Do you get to see your coaches on a regular basis? It's really difficult to see everybody all the time. So the director of sports ministries gives that other opportunity for you to have somebody else that's on the administrative staff so the coaches feel that support. It's all, the director is also a very good resource for student athletes and parents. And Kathy will go into a couple of stories here in, in, in more detail in a little bit. But also you have a dedicated person, and as an administrator, knowing that you have somebody that can and will get this done, as long as you're supporting them, then it works out really well. So why Kathy Rec? Probably the better question is, what qualities does Kathy have that <coughs> actually makes her a really good person to be a director of sports ministries when maybe typically you wouldn't have said, well, she doesn't have a sports background, she's a campus minister, so why, why was she the best person? And in actuality, when Lou brought the idea to me, he didn't say that other schools didn't have a director of sports ministries. He sold the program with the director of sports ministries as a part of it. <laughs> So, minor detail that he left out. <laughs> Guinea pigs. We were <laughs> Guinea pigs and he didn't even tell us. <laughs> but I'm glad that he did because that was one of the reasons that we bought into the program. Because there was support for the coaches, there was a dedicated person in the building, and that piece of it, it seemed, seemingly for sports leader, brought it all together and made it make a whole heck of a lot of sense. So she's in the school, she knows the students, and she is present. And so Lou touched on the presence, and I think that was one of the questions from his talk earlier, but being present, being there. She has a background in ministry. So what we can't forget is that Sports Leader is a sports ministry program. It's not an athletic program. We have those. This is a ministry program through sports. She's attentive to other stories, displays large amounts of sensitivity that does come with sarcasm sometimes, but it's still there. She uses a very non-defensive approach, which is very helpful for coaches. Provides support to the school community, demonstrates a good sense of personal dynamics. She's a great people reader, meeting people where they are, knowing where they are. And then she applies teaching techniques because she's also the head of our theology department and works as a religion teacher and working with coaches. So knowing that way to communicate with people. So with that said, I'll let her communicate with you all now. You need the thing you do. You want to play? Thanks. Slow and steady always wins the race. So I, um, we needed a strategy. It was an intentional thing to start small. Sports leader is very overwhelming, right? It's very overwhelming. And I knew that with one month to get the program together, we weren't going to be able to do it all. Uh, the beauty of midlife is you have learned how to say, no, I can't. And so uh, we decided, I decided, I am not going to try to do this for everybody. So uh, I, we put it out there to everyone, but I was not going to worry about doing that. And I wasn't going to worry about all four components. The four pillars of sports leader are very comprehensive and they're great, but I knew I couldn't do all of them. Maybe bits and pieces, maybe more with this sport than this sport, but I, again, it was about reading the landscape. 
But uh, uh, to start it off and to do it all, don't set that expectation for yourself. It grows. We presented the sports leader kind of the same thing as optional with the press. I mean, we really sold it that this is going to make your athletes better athletes and better men and better women, not necessarily in that order. Um, and, and I think you'll be sorry if you don't buy into it, but we're not going to make you. Um, mostly because I knew I couldn't follow through. I had to be very realistic because of my other commitments in the school. A generous budget. I know for a Catholic school that seems like an impossibility or contradiction, but as we um, have heard already a number of times today, uh, especially with Lou's statistics, what other program in your school besides academics do you reach over half of your population with one program? So it's worth the money. I have, what I will say about Seton LaSalle, and I hope this isn't an, um, an anomaly, but from the time I came on board 10 years ago, I've never been told no as a campus minister. I mean, I'm, I'm, you know, I use my whatever funds I have wisely, but to tell you the truth, I don't even know what my budget is. I don't have a campus ministry budget. From the time I was hired, if you need something, let us know. So ministry has always been a priority at Seton LaSalle. Um, so I've, and I, I just want to add to that only because I was speaking with our board chair who brought the idea to us in the first place. and. For those of you, how many of you have either boards of directors or limited jurisdiction or something, but they have a large control of your budget? So a lot of you. He said to me yesterday, this is the best, I'll be honest at the moment, it's cost $6,000 up front that we chose how to pay for it. You can talk with Lou about working those things out. He said, this is the best $6,000 we've ever spent. So coming from a board chair and those of you knowing how boards work and how dedicated they are to making sure that you're pinching every penny and putting that money where it needs to go, he said, this is the best $6,000 we've ever spent. And when you put your money behind something, it says something to people. So I've even said to the coaches, crossing my fingers behind my back, if there's something in the course of this program that you see that kind of couples with what we're doing and it's going to cost you something, don't worry about your booster budget. You come and see me and we'll take care of it. If there's a book you want to give the kids, if there's a speaker you want to bring in, uh, we'll take care of ordering the flowers for letters to mom. Uh, we'll do all of that. Just let me know. No, they haven't done that, but, but the money is there because it's a priority. So uh, we're very grateful for that, I, and I, I know that has made it easier for us. Attitude of flexibility from all sides eases the process. I have had to be flexible. It hasn't been easy. And so has the school. So that has helped too, as long as we're flexible. I'm a big fan of Cardinal Bernadine, for those of you from Chicago. Um, I love his metaphor of the seamless garment. Jesus' <coughs> robe not being torn in two, um, but rather a seamless garment, in the way that Cardinal Bernadine would talk about the ethic of life. And so I, I use that metaphor a lot. So we do have a seamless garment across the school landscape. Our advancement office is really into this as well. The sports leader virtue of the week Sorry, the Sports Leader Virtue of the Week comes in to our website every Sunday morning. When Lou sends it to us, it goes immediately up on the web page, and parents can click onto it, see exactly what the coaches are getting, and they um, so they know what's coming. And some of them have told me they look for it every week. We've talked at, at our table today, uh, Andrew and Luke and Lauren and I were talking about making that a school-wide virtue of the week. So we will... Um, be using it, I will present it in our religion department, certainly enough to cover there, but, um, but it can become part of the whole school um, air that we read. So it really does help, and I, I, I can't recommend this enough, if you have a person in your uh, physical plant that can do this, that has, we've said this a number of times, daily contact with the kids, that has made a really, really, really big difference. Um, I have a buy-in with the faculty, so because I'm a member of the faculty, and they're used to me interrupting their schedules for liturgies and that kind of thing anyway, uh, but I can speak at faculty meetings. I can tell them stories of success. And they know the kids too, so when I tell them something about a reconciliation with this kid who you know has a lot of pain in his life and something that had happened in a ceremony, it makes them better teachers as well. And it builds an understanding at the whole school level 
of the value of what Sports Leader does for these kids. So that has been a big help. Um, it's definitely a big help with the students. There are, um, I think it's very safe to say that I would not have ever known most of the football players until I taught them to seniors, but now they know where campus ministry is. And they say to me in the home, Ms. Ray, how are you doing? Are you having a good day today? And they wouldn't have given me the time of the day before. So it builds, I'm all about relationships. It builds relationships. And the most important thing is that kids, parents, teachers see that ministry is what comes first. And it's part of everything. There is no part of the school landscape that isn't about the gospel. And that has made a big, big difference, especially with our parents. And I love knowing people's names. I've already come to um, have a visibility with parents, again, who I would not have ever known had it not been for sports leader. Um, the other night, I was with, um, I went to, I happened to be at school late and the boys were having a volleyball game. I thought, okay, I'll make this a good way for me to make the presents. I live 40 minutes from the school, so it's not always easy for me to hang around in the evenings. And uh, to see a parent you know, walk by. Bill, I haven't seen you in a while. How's it going? And is your wife's chemo going all right? And what the impact that makes on, on a parent is just, uh, it's just so important. And it's wonderful for me. It really is. But that's, that's beside the point. Um, and another little story. I'm not as good a storyteller as Lou. But um, a number of years ago, it's a football story. I was teaching um, in one class, four of the cheerleaders, and the quarterback, biggest running back, the, the most uh, powerful running back we had. And we had had a student who was uh, asked to leave Seton LaSalle for some pretty serious violations and went to one of our biggest rivals, public school down the street, and we were getting ready to play them. And apparently he started trash talking our kids. Now I had been talking about this particular virtue of temperance for a long time, and I'm thinking, yeah, this is going in one ear and out the other. His kids aren't getting anything I'm saying in class about this. Mike comes in, and he is purple because he had just gotten a text from this kid who was now on the opponent's football team, ready to beat the daylights out of them on the field, and you better watch because you're going to leave with a broken leg. And he was fuming, and he's got a really bad temper anyway. And the running back comes in with him. Mike, settle down. Mike, settle down. You know, that's all right. We're going to kill him. We're going to kill him. Don't worry. We're going to take care of them on the field. And the boys are like building up the sharks and the jets. And I had it. I went, fine. And I, I just flipped. And I said, sure, go ahead. Be the better man. You know, lower yourself to their standards. Sure, go ahead. That'll teach you so much. And that'll really get you a win for the game, right? And they were like, what's you? You know. I said, I dare you. You want to be a man? I dare you to be the better man. I dare you to when he, when you go down and then he goes down, you get up and you reach out your hand and instead of stepping on his face, you pull him up. You want to see him be disarmed? Try it and see if it works. If you want to shut him up, be kind to him. That's what I'm trying to tell you. Oh, this is ready. The cheerleaders got into it. This is ready. We've been praying for the boys. So before I could do anything, they had moved all the chairs in the room and the cheerleaders took over. So I did what any good minister does. I stepped back. They made a circle, and they made the four or five football players in the team, in the classroom, stand in the middle. And the girls made everybody raise hands over the boys, and they prayed over them. It was beautiful. Is Ray going to be at the game tonight? You're going to be at the game? Yes, I'll be at the game tonight. You have to sit right in front of us because we're going to back off. <coughs> that kind of power. So I sat by them, and they, they emaciated the opponent. Emaciated them, and the same exact thing happened. Brandon kicked one of them down. He buckled his knee, the kid who was ready to kill Mike, down on the ground. Mike gets up on his knees, and he grabs the kid's hand, and the kid's like, here it comes. And he pulled him up. And the kid stood. And he looked at his buddy. And, and you could see the drama unfold on the field. It did something to our boys. And our boys were amazing. They were slated to lose this game by easily 15 or 20 points. 
and they took the game and they never let go of control. And the girls were looking up at me with tears rolling down their face and I kept saying, Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, you know? And the boys, it was, it was a beautiful, beautiful moment. So you can talk to your blue in the face as a teacher, but because they made the connection with sports, it's a lesson they'll never forget. That running back is now one of our running back coaches. He's um, 25 years old. And I saw Dave at the volleyball game the other night, and uh, he said, Ms. Ray, did you tell the story yet? <laughs> he still remembers the story. He didn't say, did you tell them that lesson you gave on temperance and fortitude? <laughs> Humbling. Okay, qualities. Lou stole this. I was going to do, I'm doing this thing on qualities, but Lou gave me some that were really excellent. The athlete is not one of them. But these are some things that I have found have really helped be this kind of a, you know, be in this position. So, Sabbath was made for the man, man was not made for the Sabbath. This sports leader program is not the end of it all. All right? So you have to be willing to adapt. So, teacher, so I'll use a little alliteration, ask, attend, and adapt. So, ask the coach how best to proceed, attend to the person first. I can't say that enough. The coaches are, you know, we talked at lunch, and I'm going to ask you to help each other out with this when we're done. My coaches are never going to buy into this. I've been hearing from a couple of you. How do you get coaches to buy into this? You get to know the coaches and their stories. You talk to them as men and women of faith first. And that's more important than anything. That's why I don't need to be an athlete. I need to be attentive to what's going on in them. So I have made it a point to make sure I understand their families, you know. I, Mark, the volleyball coach who was talking in the video, who was one of the bigger skeptics, was a brand new father. And when he did the sports leaders, the letters for mom ceremony, um, he, no, I'm sorry, it was the dad's jersey ceremony. At the end of it, Mark got rather choked up and he said, I have two baby girls. I had a clue how to be a father to two little girls. You girls have taught me the kind of woman I want my daughters to be. So I learned that about Mark. So now where's my starting point when I talk with Mark? The girls. It really makes a difference. Mark, our uh, basketball coach, another, another Mark, uh, was very, very into this where he saw a sports leader and spent four hours perusing the website. He was completely sold on it from the beginning until we got to the letters to mom ceremony. Did not want to do it. Attend. What's going on? So I said, Mark, uh, you got to trust me on this. It's going to work. It's going to work. You just, I'll take care of it. You don't have to do it. You know, I'll, you can take over as much as you want, but when you need me, I'm there. So we did the ceremony, and when it was all over, Mark stood up and was very, very emotional. And he said, I didn't want to do this night. He said, my, I just didn't want to do it. And I didn't know why. He said, but you have taught me. He said, my mother is dying. And I don't want to deal with it. I haven't been dealing with it. My daughters want to see their grandma and I won't take them. I'm going to take them tomorrow, and I want to thank you for that. So you never know. You have no idea what's going on. Um, there's that wonderful saying that, you know, be kind to everyone you meet. Everyone is carrying their own burden, some kind of cross. So kind of try to do that. Adapt. Teams often have unique circumstances. It doesn't work for everybody. Our cheerleading family story was a reality TV show. You know, it was the worst of what cheerleader moms can be like. Not all of them, but a couple. And it divided the team. And as a good a woman as she is, our cheerleading coach used to be a cheerleader. And she's young. And so it wasn't helpful. But she, she wanted to do the right thing, but didn't really have a clue. She was actually part of the problem and didn't even know it. You know, so there was no way sports leader ceremonies were going to work. There was no way we were going to do parent ceremonies. So I just kept working with her. We kept meeting at Panera for coffee, and I would listen, and I would listen, and I would listen. And my ministry to the cheerleading department was listening to the coach. And finally, 
I said, what do you think about having a Saturday morning retreat just for the girls? No sports leader stuff, just a cheerleading retreat. So long story short, we did a retreat with the girls. I put in some ritual. Catholics are great at ritual. And um, the healing that took place, the things the girls said to one another in the context of forgiveness and reconciliation. We used the, the, um, the gospel story of the woman caught in adultery and Jesus writing in the sand. So I brought in this big box of sand. And the girls wrote their sins in the sink of what they did to break down the team. And then I said, do you want to wash it away? And someone else would come up and wash away the sins of one of the other girls. It was a beautiful ceremony, and those girls are a different team. So you have to be willing to adapt. You have to pay attention. But it works. But you still have to trust Lou and the sports leader process. There he is. Because Lou would say things like, okay, so Lou, this kid doesn't have a father, and what are we going to do with the dad ceremony? Trust me. Trust me. He must have said that to me a hundred times. Trust him. Trust him. Oh, when did you do that, Lauren? That's cute. Positivity. Is that a word? Interpret everything in the most favorable sense is a maxim I learned early in my faith formation. When you're met with a closed door, or with excuses going not to participate, look for any window. Our golf coach, it was one of the first ceremonies of the first season, one month after Lou came and did the training. Did not want to do the ceremonies. It's not my gig, I don't do that kind of thing. We kept talking, we kept working, and we rearranged it and adapted it, and it worked. He said, well, we have a picnic after golf. I said, great, we'll do something with the picnic came in the back door and it worked very well. And he didn't even want to do it and he had no way to back out of it at that point. So it was great. You catch more bears with honey. Uh, we've already said this. We did not mandate sports leader and it's really important not to respond defensively. Maybe, and I don't know that I would have gotten away with this before, but maybe that's why it's good not to have a, an athlete. Because I, I, I hear what Lou was saying about coaches. We're about winning. I'm not about winning. You know, you don't work for the church to win. <clears throat> well, in the big picture, you know. That, the benefits are out of this world. Is that the, you know, that's the joke? So it's not personal. I'm not, I don't care if you don't like what I'm doing. I'm not going to get defensive with you. We're not going to have to one-up each other. So that's why it kind of helps to have somebody who's, you know, blues. Compassion. Everything has the potential. This is St. Ignatius again. Everything, this is from his first principle and foundation. Everything on which the spiritual exercises are built. Everything has the potential of calling forth in us a more loving response to our life with God. Remember, it is ministry all around. It's about God. It is about coming into relationship with God. Learn the family story. Learn the kids' family stories. It really makes a big difference. That's why the mentoring is so important. I love Mark's comment that I got to know more about those girls in five minutes than I ever would have learned at any other time. Integrity and empathy. I had to learn this. It's one thing to talk the talk, but I thought if I'm gonna get coaches to buy into this, into the show me, I better have a reason to back it up. So I thought, well, the thing that Lou even told us is, be careful, mentoring is gonna be the hardest part of this process. It's gonna be the hardest part of the buying is to get coaches to mentor. So I thought, well, if I want coaches to mentor, I better try it myself. So I teach three sections of seniors. That means I have 81 students for three weeks. I mentored every one of those kids every week. Now, I didn't do the five to 10 minutes because, you know, I couldn't. But one to two minutes, I made myself a schedule of my students. And over the course of five days, every one of those students, I either went up to them at their locker and had a 30-second conversation with them, or I messed around with them a little bit in the, um, as they were walking in the classroom door, or I made a particular effort at the end of the period, but I went through my checklist, and I got every one of those kids, and my chair in campus ministry in my office uh, was not empty for months afterwards. They were coming. I, I, I didn't know I could talk to you about this, but I want to talk to you about my dad. I had kids. I didn't, I didn't get anything done because I had kids coming to me. But isn't that why we're here? So the mentoring works. It, it works. But I had to try it myself to tell my coaches it worked. Now I can say with authority that it works. 
And um, most importantly, most importantly, as Abraham Joshua Heschel says, if the only prayer we ever utter is thanks, it would be enough. So gratitude. And remembering that, you know, we, when we buy into a program, we get so worried about six, we're not in charge. If we put God in charge, can we put God in charge? And trust that if we have said that from the moment this is going to be the work of God, that God's going to take care of it. Maybe not this year, maybe not this season, but maybe four seasons from now, the coach will come up to you and say, I got it. Now, we don't have that kind of experience yet, but I certainly have enough experience in ministry that that's the case. We um, theology people like to talk about the difference between chronos and kairos, right? Chronos is chronological time, kairos is God's time, and they're very different. We are on kairos. This ministry program is about God's time. It's not about us. Okay? So, we've learned a couple of things so far. We'll share that with you kind of together. How are we doing on time? Well, I have no concept of chronos. <laughs> Ten minutes for us. And then questions? Okay. So, just a little bit of what we've learned so you can learn from our mistakes and our successes, and then we'll turn it over for questions. Sit back and observe. So basically this is the year that we're observing everything. Take all the feedback that you can take and then utilize that in the decision-making process as you're planning for the next year. But remembering that this is only our first year, and so we still have the big picture in mind when we're doing this, but the big picture matters. And that was one of the biggest things with the coaches was we're taking this slowly, we want your feedback. Let us know how this is working with you, and then we'll make adjustments as we go along. Yeah, and we, um, what I would recommend to you, if you're beginning to think about buying into this process, I have to admit, uh, we didn't know until well into having already bought into it that it's a three-year process. And so um, we said to Lou, oh, you mean there's, what do we do the second year? Oh, well, we got that all worked out well. That would have nice to know when we started. So there is a three-year process. You're going to learn more about that uh, as Lou talks about training in the next thing. But, um, you know, we should have learned more than we did from the, from the get-go. But, well, you know, we're learning. We're figuring it out. Um, and we'll decide after that. And we have to say this. And we're still, we kind of talk back and forth with the AD, um, especially because we have a, a couple of coaches who have not bought in, and one who was rather, actually not even not buying in, he was very, um, had a lot of animosity about it. But I think that some of that had to do with the nature of his sport. You know, it's, it's you know how sports have different personalities. We have kind of observed that from the outside, I think. Um, very, very uh, negative about it. He was very resentful that we would even suggest that there might be another way to do this. So, uh, we haven't decided if we're going to mandate participation in sports leader. We're going to wait till the three years is over, and then we're going to decide. But in the meantime, and in the small window that we've been doing this, the feedback that we've gotten from the rest of the coaches is that we really like this program, it's really helped build our communication with our students, but on top of that, when you have these parent ceremonies, and then you give these fathers the opportunity to present jerseys, especially to their daughters, um, sons are good, but the daughters, you know, it's that extra special bond. And then when the sons read their letters to their mothers and the daughters and vice versa, you have this bond now where you've created a positive atmosphere <coughs> within your sports program for all of the families. And when you bring that in, the coaches have said, oh, it's, I haven't had a parent phone call yet this year. And these are, as most of you know, a lot of our parents um, are very active in our school communities, Passionate. they're passionately involved, and so with that comes a little bit of uh, sometimes criticism that can be less constructive than you would like it to be, but the coaches have noticed that they're building these relationships now through the ceremonies where they're involving the parents in a positive way that doesn't have to do with the sport itself, and now they can have an actual conversation, not just my kid didn't get enough playing time. That still happens. But they have a conversation that's not yelling on the phone the day after the game. And I will tell you personally, well, every now and then, those of us that have uh, good athletic programs, we go, can we please just be mediocre? 
That would be great because that's fewer issues. But I have had significantly less parent phone calls, as has our athletic director. And we can actually attribute it to this because the parents have bought in. They bought in because they understand what the concept is, but now they're forming these connections with the coaches that they didn't have before. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and they're also going to be the best. That I think that that was saying over over here before that um, we're Catholics. We're all about ritual. You know, that's what we do. And so the parent ceremonies make really great sense to Catholics. But it's also very well done, Lou. A great and Paul, a great marketing tool. You get parents involved, and uh, if you are a parent of high school kids, it's one thing when you're, you're in a Catholic grade school and they need you to be very, very active, and it's one way for you to stay involved. But once you get to high school, your kids don't know you anymore. They have, you have to drop them off at the end of the parking lot so they can't be seen with you, and they don't. You're not my mother, and so when they have this experience, they can be a part of their child's life. Because, you know, if you have sons who come home from school, how was your day? It's okay. What'd you learn? Nothing. Yeah. 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 So it's a way for parents to really feel like they've connected. And don't mess with mama bear. So if a coach isn't doing it, why aren't we doing mother ceremony? What do you mean we're not, what do you, what do you mean you're not doing mother ceremony? What do you mean you're not doing moms? And so parents will, I, I think parents are gonna be one of our greatest allies down the road. We have some coaches, we have a coach, one in the spring sports season, who chose not to do it this year. He went through the training, uh, but just didn't quite buy in yet, who has athletes who are on the football team. And already those parents are going, well, why aren't you doing this? And that is going to be more effective than any conversation Kathy and I can have with that coach. Either that or it's going to screw us into the ground for sure. Either way. We'll let <laughs> you know. say that's God's <laughs> job, not ours. There is no failure. Interpret everything in the most favorable sense. All right? If all we move is this much forward, we've moved forward. So be very, very positive. Everything is a step forward. Every piece that we implement is more than we did before. Bishop of Rocky's reflection on the empty tomb was lovely this morning, was it not? It was a beautiful, beautiful homily. It was much better than I could have said what I was going to say. I wanted to bring the resurrection into that, and I don't need to try to restate his words in my own way, but to bring it full circle, it, it really is connected to what we do in ministry. I'll, one of the reasons I like teaching high school as opposed to little children is that you can mess with their heads and you can try to screw up their way of thinking and get away with it. You don't traumatize them into therapy, you wake them up. And I love being able to do that. I'm kind of sadistic that way. And um, so when we start to talk about the resurrection, I'll say, well, prove it. How do you know Jesus rose from the dead? You can prove it in this era of the scientific method. Prove to me that he rose from the dead. Where, where is the proof? Well, it's in the Bible, so the Bible's not a history book. It was not meant, ever written, the Gospels are not history books, the testimonies of faith. Prove it. And they can't believe the religion teacher is saying, prove to me the resurrection. Well, how do you prove it? And I said, the way I prove it is, you have a bunch of men locked up in a room, chickens, that even if they say they experience the risen Christ eating fish, prove it. And they're still up in the upper room. And even when the women told them what they experienced, they didn't believe them. The apostle to the apostles was not given any credibility. How we prove the resurrection is those are the ones who went out. And I love, I love the readings of this week of the octave from, from Acts of the Apostles. Peter, illiterate chicken Peter, is curing and healing and raising from the power of the Holy Spirit, raising from the dead. There's your proof of the resurrection. That's the proof of the resurrection is what it did for us. And so sports leader is very much about that. You can't prove things are going to work. But when Christ, the risen Christ, is a part of what we do, hearts are changed, lives are changed, and conversion takes place. And that's what we're about. So we don't need to do any more than that. We don't need statistics and surveys. 
when we see small changes in kids' hearts that are so hard to change and our kids are so wounded and they're being fed such garbage, when things make an impact on them and it happens through what they love the most besides their families and that's sports, then the empty tomb presents itself in our athletic programs. So, praise Jesus. So, uh, that's what we have to say to you.